Next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the keys to Christian growth. Now, at one point, I was going to call it spiritual growth. But then I, I did some poking around on the internet, and you don't want to just talk in a church about spiritual growth, because some people's idea of spiritual growth has nothing to do with Christ. It's all kind of Eastern spiritism. So I wanted to be very specific. We're going to be talking about the keys to Christian growth, growing as a Christian. Heard about some tourists that were visiting a number of sites around Europe. And they were traveling together in a van and they'd stop at the different locations and they didn't have a tour guide with them but they'd inquire about what was happening from place to place. They were looking at some of the, the places where great people like Luther and Calvin and some of the different kings and monarchs and people of history were born and where they lived. And, and they came to this beautiful picturesque village on the border of France and Switzerland and uh, they were taking pictures and looking around and they saw a man sitting there by the town square and they said, were any great men born in this village? And he answered with his French accent and said, no, only babies. <laughs> no great men, only babies born here. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how old you are, if you are 9 or 90, if you have accepted Christ, you're a baby at first. You're a baby Christian. And that's normal. That's wonderful. You're born again. But you don't want to stay a baby. It is a tragedy when you meet people who have been Christians for years and they've not grown. Uh, not grown in the right direction anyway. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as carnal, as babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you're not able to receive it. And even now you're still not able, for you are carnal. For wherever there's envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Well, uh, for one thing, I'm glad that he said that they were babes in Christ, even though they were behaving carnally. Now, a baby, they're very cute, they're lovely, they're pure in many ways, and they're very selfish. They're what you would call carnal creatures. Uh, what's on a baby's mind? I want to be comfortable. I want to be entertained. Uh, I want to be fed. If I need a cleaning, clean me. Babies are not thinking, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you? <laughs> They're very selfish. And you know, when you first come to Christ, you may come to Christ because you say, I don't want to go to a lake of fire, and I do want to go to heaven. So you're thinking about yourself, and that might be a suitable starting point. But as you mature as a Christian, you're supposed to overcome the total selfish, carnal way of thinking and begin to eat more substantial Christian food. Hebrews chapter 5, and we believe Paul wrote this as well. Verse 12, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who, who partakes of only milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Now there is the milk of the word and there is the meat of the word. If you are an evangelist and you're doing an evangelistic meeting, you are giving the milk of the word because you know, people, they, they need the basics and you got to break it down. You need to make it simple. But as your pastor and you're talking to people who've been walking with the Lord 50, 60, 80 years, then you ought to be able to talk about some of the meat of the word, some of some deeper thoughts. And this, the Bible is a, a mine full of treasure that has no bottom and there's so many lofty exciting themes in there that we ought to grow in our understanding and if there was anyone in the Bible that liked the meat of the word it was Paul read some of the stuff he says in Galatians and, and Romans and, and he waxes eloquent in Ephesians and Philippians and even Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 he said, even as our beloved brother Paul writes to you in his letters, in which are some things hard to understand. It's definitely not baby food. 
And Peter says, those who are unstable, they're babies. They don't understand. They can twist them as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Peter calls Paul's deep writing scripture. But he said, some of it requires thinking. And so, as you walk with the Lord, God wants us to, here's the point of our message, grow. Um, it's not enough to just become a Christian. Once you accept Christ, you want to grow. Do you ever worry, am I growing as a Christian? How many of you would say, I want to grow stronger in the Lord. I want to grow closer to the Lord. I want to grow more effective in God's Word. I mean, who wants to stay the same? Don't you want to grow? And so I thought that was important and we should talk about it together. A Christian must grow. Look at this, 2 Peter 3.18 Christians must grow, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be both glory now and forever. Amen. So here Peter closes his message encouraging them to grow. And not only in 2 Peter and 1 Peter he talks about grow in the Lord. Now if anyone knew about growing in the Lord, Peter should have known something. Because when he first followed Jesus, he said, Lord, depart from me, I am a sinful man. And you look at how he stumbled and bumbled along the way. In one moment, Peter says something that Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father in heaven, you just spoke the word of God. And a few minutes later, Jesus says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because you don't know what you're talking about. And, and so Peter kind of had his mouth in gear before his brain was engaged. Frequently he's talking, he doesn't even know what he's saying. He had a lot of growing to do. Stands up and says, though all men forsake thee, I'll never forsake thee. And Jesus said, oh no, you're going to do it three times before the sun rises. And, uh, but then he realized following the Lord, he grew, he matured. You look at Peter, you look at him at Pentecost, you look at him in chapter 4 and chapter 3, and you see Peter's growing, isn't he? in the Lord. He's not denying the Lord. He's growing in maturity and, and we all want that experience. Now there's things you can do to encourage growth and there's things you can do to miss out on growth and we'll be talking about both. First of all Jesus said Mark 4 26 the kingdom of God is, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day meaning day and night, day and night goes by and the seed should sprout and grow and he himself does not know how. The seed does what? It sprouts and it doesn't stay the same. It grows. Now whenever I look in the backyard uh, and I do it frequently, I, I get a little thrill. Let me tell you the story. Our neighbor at our old house, uh, actually uh, the Henry family, they built the Sacramento Central Church. Just a uh, it's one of the coincidences of God that I moved next door to the family that built Sacramento Central. Didn't even know it until we bought the house. And still good friends. And uh, they had pomelo trees in their backyard. Now pomelos are like oversized grapefruits. Or they're not normal but they're really good. How many of you have eaten a pomelo before? I really, when I first ate my first one in Israel, I really liked pomelos. And I was so excited because the Henrys, they had two different kinds of trees. They had pink ones and white ones. They were giving us pomelos during season in abundance. When I realized we were moving to Rockland, I thought, I don't know how I could live without those pomelos. And I thought, well, I'm going to grow my own pomelo trees. So I got online. I said, how do you do this? How do you sprout citrus? And I looked and it says, well, first you take the seeds, you dry them a little bit, then you lay them in a paper towel and you wait this long. You'll see them start to sprout. And you put them in the ground. I did all that. And I started out with, I don't know, a dozen plants. And I took the best ones. I watched them. The little seed started to soften. It put out the little sprig. I said, ah, it's alive. It's a miracle. And then, you know, I, I wrapped it up, kept it in the sunshine, made sure it didn't dry out, and just kept it going. Then I finally got mature enough where I put it in some soil. I kept watching, waiting for it to poke through, and then it poked through, and a little bitty leaf coming up, and I was so excited. And I'm making a lot out of a little story, but <laughs> it's really, I've been watching them now. They're trees in our backyard that I planted from a seed. And I watched you go and it's a miracle. I mean seeds are miracles when you think about it. Uh, yeah, they're my babies. <laughs> it's 
So, and one's a white pomelo, and one's going to be hopefully pink. And uh, it's a miracle when you think about, they have seeds that they found in King Tut's tomb. They had some beans, they put them in the sunlight with some moisture and warmth, and they sprouted 3,000 years old. How does God somehow store the essence of life in a seed like that and thousands of years later? It, just the right conditions, it'll grow. And so the secret that Jesus is telling us here about growth is if you give the right conditions, it is natural for you to grow. If they're neglected, you won't grow. The right conditions then were the warmth, the light, the moisture, the soil. Given those conditions, this is what's going to happen. If you neglect some of those things, any of those things, take away the light, take away the moisture, take away the soil, the air, and it'll die. That is also true in your life. There are spiritual laws that cannot be denied. You need the sunlight, the warmth, the moisture, the air, the soil, and a healthy seed will grow. In the book Christ's Object Lessons, page 66, the author says, the germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life, and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace, there can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. Conversely, this year I decided we haven't had any vegetables for a while, so I went and I got two tomato plants. Now in the past I've gotten cherry tomatoes, and they put out so many cherry tomatoes that half of them rot on the ground. Any of you had that before? You can't eat them all. So I said, I don't want to get carried away. So I got one cherry tomato plant, one tomato plant for my sandwiches. But I did not choose wisely. And one of the plants never did grow. It just, it kind of sprouted and grew a little bit, but it just started dying right away. It was like a slow death. And I kept watering it and kept doing everything. It just, I don't know what was wrong. I over fertilized the soil, but something was wrong and it never produced. But then the other one, if you give it the right things, it'll produce naturally. Given the right conditions, at every stage of development in our life, we may be perfect yet growing. So if you're not all you want to be, don't be discouraged. Are you being faithful where you are now? Yet, if God's purpose is for us fulfilled, uh, fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. Being a Christian is something like riding a bicycle. It's very hard to keep it up if you're not moving. If you're not growing, it's hard to go in the right direction. You can't steer a sailboat if it's not moving. Um, the Christian life, there's something dynamic about it. Second Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5, examine yourselves as whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you're disqualified. So it's a good idea every now and then to like I did with those seeds and those tomato plants, check on them. Am I growing? You know, sometimes in the Christian life you feel like you're going up a, a hill with slippery mud and you take two steps forward and you slide back a step. Uh, and you're struggling onward. Am I the only one that's had that experience? But at some point you gotta say, am I making progress? I remember once I was flying, back when I had the plane, I was flying from Medford, Oregon, back to Sacramento, and I had to fly by Mount Shasta. And Interstate 5, you know, goes right between Mount Shasta in uh, California there. And there was so much of a headwind, I, I felt like I'm not getting anywhere. At first I thought, oh, I'm doing fine. I've got, look, it says that I'm going, you know, 140 miles an hour when I looked at my speedometer. The speedometer measures the air. But when I looked on the ground at the highway, Volkswagen bugs were passing me. <laughs> because I was flying into a 160 mile an hour headwind. I thought I was doing great when I just looked at the speedometer, but then I looked on the ground and I said, I'm not going anywhere, I'm being passed by Pintos and I'm in an airplane. 
<laughs> because the wind was so fast, it was the strangest sensation. <laughs> so in the same way, every now and then we need to take an estimate, we need to take an inventory to see, are we growing? And the, some growth is painful. Now, not all growth is good. Not all growth is towards God. George MacDonald said, you know, you can grow just for the sake of growing. It can be cancer. So you want the right kind of growth. You've heard of growing pains. Sometimes growing as a Christian can be a painful process. And it's not physically painful, but the pain is real nonetheless. And uh, in the end, it's worth the pain. You don't want to neglect the growth. Now, uh, this is an important point I don't often hear mentioned. In the Christian life, transformation isn't all immediate. Not all growth is instant. Some is. Adam was created all growed. <laughs> when Adam was made, he did not have to learn how to talk. When Adam was made, he was made with built-in coordination. Adam was created in a miraculous way, a totally new creature. He was fully operational. It's like you can sometimes get a, a, a computer and then you got to buy the software and you got to install it. Adam came from the factory with pre-installed software. It was all ready to go. But every child of Adam after that has had to learn from the parents how to walk and how to talk and how to eat and how to act and what's important. And there's a lot of growing that happens. Babies are beautiful, but there's a big difference between a baby and a man. Uh, a man has a lot more endurance. A man has a lot more knowledge. A man has a lot more strength. There's great advantages in being a grown man. Don't stay a baby all the time. You want to grow as a Christian. Now, there are a few child prodigies out there. I read about one man, William Sittis. He was an American child prodigy. He was a mathematical prodigy. He entered Harvard at 11. As an adult, he was conversant in 25 languages. Mozart, they say, was a music prodigy. And every now and then you meet these kids that just is, the first time they sit down at a piano, they plunk a couple of notes and then they can play anything they hear. They're just, they're just gifted. It's unusual. Most have to be taught. Some people, I've seen it before, when they first come to Jesus, they go through a dramatic conversion. It doesn't often happen like this, but I have seen it. And I don't want to deny the power of God. I, I know a fellow that he came to the Lord, God spoke to him, he quit drinking, he quit smoking, he quit cursing, he gave up his drug lifestyle, he was just totally transformed day one. It wasn't so easy for me. And maybe I'm the only one, but for me, I battled along through those things. Yeah, I struggled, it took me a while. I didn't give up drinking and smoking at the same time. First I gave up pot, then later I gave up cigarettes. <laughs> And, uh, there, you know, it was, it was a process for me. Some of you heard my little story about cold confession. It took me 50 years to give up ice cream. Now, I'm not saying that's a sin, but for me, it got to where it was out of control. But it was a struggle. But, you know, I pray, I look back now, I say, praise the Lord. I got the victory over haagen <laughs> So, there's growth that happens. Sometimes it's immediate, but usually it is a learning process, which is the most important point. You can be justified instantly. Sanctification takes time, but it shouldn't take forever. If you have been walking with the Lord 20 years and you still can't say the Lord's Prayer, you're not growing. Am I right? I mean, you, you ought to have some scriptures memorized. If you've been walking with the Lord 20 years and you don't have regular times for prayer, if you're sporadic in your church attendance. Um, Paul was dramatically converted on the road to Damascus and he just completely was transformed. He didn't still spend a few years in Arabia. Now I'm not saying that because there's sanctification that means when you come to the Lord and you're converted and you're a thief let's say, 
that now that you're converted, instead of stealing a thousand dollars a week, you're going to cut back to a hundred. And then you're going to cut back to fifty, and then twenty, and then ten. No, you ought to quit stealing all of it. But there are other areas in your life where you may find that there's a battle. Why? Because you spent your whole life learning to think a certain way. So much sin is because of the way you think. That God's wired us so that when we're converted, we now have the Holy Spirit, you still need to learn to think differently. It's almost like with conversion, you're, first you're lost, you know, you're walking in this direction, you're going towards the broad road to destruction. God gets your attention, you're converted, you change directions, but you know what? You're still in the same place. Now you need to learn to do different things. There's a learning process. And not only can you be learning this, but you know, sometimes you're, you're a Christian and then you start getting interested in the world, you start learning and going the other direction. That learning process goes both ways. So look at these verses, Isaiah 1.16, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doing before my eyes, cease to do evil, notice this, learn to do good. How many of you went to school? You went one day, right? Learned it all in one day? Is that how learning happens? Or does learning take a process? Learn to do good. Look again, John 6.45, it is written in the prophets, Jesus is speaking here, it is written in the prophets and they shall all be taught of God. Therefore everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Why did the disciples follow Jesus for three years before he ascended to heaven? Three and a half. So he could teach them. And when he ascended to heaven, had they learned it all yet? even three and a half years of walking with the greatest teacher in the world, Jesus is ready to go to heaven and the disciples say, are you going to wipe out the Romans now and set up Israel as a kingdom? And Jesus said, no. That's <laughs> some lessons you still have to learn. That's not why I came. There's still some things they didn't understand. And so there's a process, there's growth, but you definitely see the growth happening among the apostles. Ephesians 5.10, finding out what is best acceptable to the Lord. Now one reason we know that it's important to grow is because everybody believes you can grow backwards. It's called backsliding. Do you all believe in backsliding? You know someone who's backslidden? Maybe you've backslidden? And it's not back hopping, jumping, or skipping. It slides. Slowly. People can drift away from the Lord. And in the same way you can slowly drift away from the Lord, be encouraged, you can slowly drift towards the Lord. But it takes effort. Doesn't take effort to stand still. If you're on slippery ground, you will slide. It's like living on a glacier. It's going to move. You may not feel it. But you'll be moving down. Glaciers never move up. Did you know that? They always move down. And if you are not making an effort to oppose the escalator of sin, you are on the down escalator, that's where you're going to go. You have to make an effort to go up. Karen and I were at an ASI meeting years ago and uh, the meeting went long and they were supplying our lunch that day. We're in a big convention center and the meal was served upstairs. We just got out of a main meeting and there's like 5,000 people. And everybody kind of wandered out into this big lobby and there's a, an escalator going up to the meeting area and there was a big bottleneck because everybody's trying to go up this little escalator. Maybe two people could stand side by side on this and you got 5,000 people trying to get up to lunch. But I elbowed Karen and I looked at the down escalator. Nobody was going up the down escalator. I thought, what a waste. So I said, I see where I'm going. I was hungry. And so I took off going up the down escalator. I looked behind me and Karen in her high heels was right behind me. <laughs> and everyone's watching us. <laughs> I thought, well, nobody's using it. Nobody's coming down. Everyone's going to eat. They're not leaving. And so everybody was watching us. And as we got to the top, they all applauded because for Karen, not for me. <laughs> she, she kept up with me. But that's kind of like the Christian life. Uh, you've got to make an extraordinary effort and you can resist the no natural glacier downward spiral. Revelation 2 verse 4, nevertheless I have this against you, that you've left your first love. You grew the wrong way. Remember therefore, Jesus said there's a remedy. Remember therefore whence you have fallen, repent and do the first works. 
There's something that should be done in order to grow in love. Or else I'll come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Hosea 11 verse 7, my people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, not at all exalt, they don't exalt, exalt Him. You know there's no such thing as a sudden fall from the Lord, it's usually a series of steps. I read an interesting fact a few years ago, I shared on the radio program about a lady who grew backwards. She lived in Virginia a number of years ago. This is reported in the Virginia Medical Monthly. Her doctor told the story. She had grown normally, married, had three children. Life was fine until her husband and her father died in a short period of time. When the children were in high school, the mother began to double her devotion to the children and she started to act and dress like them. She changed her clothes from those of a woman to a girl of 20. She joined in her children's parties and fun. At first they thought this was great. But in a few years the children noticed that as they grew older their mother was growing younger, faster. Psychiatrists call this personality regression, which means a person is like walking backwards. Usually such people stop going backwards at a certain age, but not this woman. She slipped backwards at the rate of about a year every three months for four, four months at a uh, of a time let me say that again. She slipped backward at the rate of one year for every three or four months of time that went forward. Although she was 61 years old, she acted and talked like a six-year-old. Eventually she was put in a sanitarium where she insisted on wearing short dresses, playing with toys and babbling like a child. Then she became like a three-year-old. She spilled her food, she crawled on the floor, she cried mama, backward further still until like a one-year-old, she drank milk and curled up finally like a tiny baby and eventually died. Just in her mind, she just was going backwards. And I wondered how many people have been raised in the church and for a while they're fine and something snaps and they just start going in the wrong direction. Backwards growth. Second Peter 2 verse 20, for if after all they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this is talking about people who have escaped, they're again entangled and overcome, the latter end for them is worse than, for, than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog is turned to his own vomit and the pig that was washed to wallowing in the mire. And even many who followed Jesus when he did the miracles and he was feeding the multitude and healing them, when he finally told them what was expected in taking up their cross, it says, this is an interesting verse, John 666. John chapter 6 verse 66, you know what that says? And from that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It's interesting, that's John 666. You'll remember that now, won't you? They decided not to follow him anymore. They backslid. So we know that there's a problem. Uh, what is the answer? There's seven keys. I'm not going to get through all of them today. Seven keys to spiritual growth. And it's basically when a baby's born, it's the same seven things a baby needs. Food, air, exercise, family, regular cleaning, rest and love. I don't have seven fingers in this hand so you'll have to use your imagination for those last two. So these are the seven keys. If a person does these things on a regular basis, they will grow. If you want spiritual growth, these are, these are the things. So what's the food, first thing? Food. What do you think the food is? It's the Bible. You got to eat right. You got to eat right and you got to eat regular. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You will become like what you listen to and what you look at. You are the sum total of what you're taking into your mind. If you want there to be a change in who you are, there needs to be a change in what you eat. Talking about what you're eating. What do you feed yourself? What are you reading? What are you watching? You're kidding yourself if you're watching bad things and you're thinking that is having no inf impact on who you are as a person and how it shapes your character. 
everybody is going to be the sum total of what they eat. They say you are what you eat. It's true physically, it's true spiritually. And most of you know what I'm sharing now. I say it all the time, but the, the single most important thing you can do is read the Word. Spend time regularly in the Bible. Make it a priority. You know the Gerber Baby Food Company says babies are our business, our only business. They are into making good baby food, but you don't want to eat baby food forever. Eventually you want to be growing in your knowledge. And, and uh, you know, it shouldn't just be milk all the time. Now if you're a baby, that's great. And you want a baby to have a good appetite. Uh, we, we have a, a new grandbaby, Benjamin Batchelor. How old is he now? Four months? Five months? Yeah. Last picture we saw, we've only seen him a couple of times. You just can't tell which end is out. All oh, this is mama's milk and you can roll him. He's just <laughs> ripples everywhere. And uh, now when you see that, see you all laugh. You think, that's good. When you see a fat little baby and you know he's just mama's milk and he's fat, you say that's good sign. He's eating. Got a good appetite. He's healthy. He's growing. That's what you want. If you got a scrawny skinny baby, there's something, something very disturbing about a baby if you see the ribs. Right? You want them to be healthy. Now you don't want to be like, you don't want to look like Buddha when you're 40. <laughs> but if for baby it's fine. And you don't want to be eating milk when you're 40. I had a friend I worked with once, he said he had a terrible ulcer and back in his day he said the only thing I can eat was milk for six months. I'm sure that wasn't the best solution but that's what he did. I thought how sad, grown man, nothing but milk. Eventually you want to grow where you can eat solid food, get more nourishment, continue growing, developing muscle. It's not all baby fat. Faith comes by hearing. You want more faith? You want a mature faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Job says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now when you're a baby, you must be spoon fed. Um, as you get a little older, you know, you eventually put a spoon in the baby's hand and they're sitting sometimes in a high chair and you try to help them, you put the spoon in their hand, you take the spoon and you put it in their mouth and, and sometimes they'll throw the spoon across the room and they just take their hands and put it in their mouth. Sometimes take their hands and put it in their ear and in their nose and, and they're learning to feed themselves. And it's cute, you know, as long as you got a shower curtain on the floor or something to clean up. It is, but when they get a little older, if you see an adult doing like that, you go move to another room. <laughs> right? You want to learn how to feed yourself. There are so many baby Christians out there. Friends, I hope you won't take offense. I'm just telling you honestly. All they get all week long is what they get in church once a week. They're not feeding themselves. If you're a mature Christian, you have your own personal Bible study plan and you really have no excuse for not having one except that you don't care or it's not a priority, but that's going to be, the result will be your relationship with the Lord. There's so many opportunities for you to download a Bible reading program, a thousand different things. You can say, I want to do a program where I go through the Gospels. I want to do a program where I go through the history. I want to read through the Bible chronologically. I want to study faith, grace, hope. And this is a million different ways you can study the Word and be in the Word. So to act like, well, I don't know how. Well, you, you could if you wanted to. If you were hungry, you'd figure it out. And in the last days, when we go through a great time of trouble and we're going to be challenged about what we believe, we need to know how to give an answer to anyone who asks us for the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We need to be able to defend what we believe. When Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he didn't say, hang on, do you have a Bible somewhere? I'll find a promise. He had stored the word in his mind. He right away said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Jesus did not memorize and recite scripture using any supernatural power that is above and beyond what is available to you. The same way he quoted the Bible to the devil is the same way you and I can do it. He read it at his mother's knee, she taught him the word, probably learned scripture songs, he studied it as an adult, as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, he stood up to read the scriptures, certainly every Sabbath, but then on a daily basis he was storing the word of God. So when the trials came, he had a word. 
We, if we're going to be mature, if we're going to be able to fight the good fight of faith in the last days, we need to be focusing on the Word of God and knowing why we believe what we believe. And when the devil comes to tempt us, God has given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partakers of the divine nature. Memorize the promises of God. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, Job says. How often do you forget to eat for a day? Now you might choose to fast, but does anyone here forget to eat for a day? Why? you've got this sensor inside your stomach and it goes off and says food, food, food. And some of you, it's going off all the time whether you need it or not. <laughs> but uh, we, it's very natural for us to hunger. Well when you're born again, we talked about this when we studied the Beatitudes. You, you hunger for the Word of God. Jeremiah said, your words were found and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Why is the word so important to someone who falls in love with Jesus? Christ is the living word. When you say you love the Bible, we're not talking about a bunch of words in a book. When you say you love the Bible, you're talking about I love Christ. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's really saying I love Jesus. I, I want him in my life. If you are hungering for Jesus, what is the most practical thing you can do to get Christ in your mind? Read his word. So this is one of the most important keys to spiritual growth. Jesus said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now we are all feeding our souls, but what are we feeding them? Isaiah said, chapter 55 verse 2, why do you spend your money for that is, which is not bread? They we're spending our money, but not for the right bread. And your wages for that that does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Isaiah is not talking about food here. He's talking about satisfying your soul. He said, eating the things that will satisfy your soul. He says, you're eating, but you're not eating the right thing. You know, it's interesting that we're living at a time in the world where the World Health Organization says that there is a, um, an increase in global hunger. That there are 11% of the world's population, 7 plus billion people, are hungry and it's growing. You would think that with all the food in the world right now that wouldn't be, and it's especially a paradox, it's ironic right now because we're also living at a time not only where there are millions of hungry children, but in prosperous parts of the world, children are not dying from hunger, they're dying from diseases related with overeating the wrong thing. They're eating, but they're not eating the good thing. <laughs> this is just oh, you know, like soda pop and sugar and empty calories and not a regular schedule and kids, there's an epidemic of type 2 diabetes right now says, eat that which is good. Well, a lot of Christians are not eating the right thing. They're eating junk food. Spiritual junk food. Where they're, they're watching things and if you ask them about the latest TV series, they know the answers to all those things. Because uh, they're filling their time and their mind with that. This is probably one of the most important things we can do to make a difference in our spiritual growth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And the Bible is what you would call wonder bread. Now it's not just reading the Bible. I, I'm going to give you several points about what you do with the Bible in growing through the Word. Hear it, read it. Now well, let me just support that real quick. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things that are written therein. So you've got to read the Word. I'm assuming some of you can read, but if you can't read, you can hear. I'm hoping you're doing both. When you come to church, you not only read, but you're hearing the Word. When I drive in the car, uh, I, I listen to Bible tapes. Uh, I listen to Christian radio. Uh, we've got the Bible on CD and a thousand other ways. You can click on an internet site and it'll just read the Bible to you now if, if you're online. But listen to the Word. And there's some people, I, I, they read the Word, and I really like the way they read it. They do a really good job. They're easy to listen to. And 
If you want to learn how to pronounce different difficult uh, verses in the Bible or words or names or places, listen to some of the other experts who are reading it. You go, oh, that's how you say that. But it'll do something for you. Also, you can listen to the word through preachers who are preaching it. You know, uh, Ellen White did not only read Ellen White. Did you know that? She read other Christian authors. I've seen her library. She fed her soul, not only on the Bible, but on other good spiritual material. And as I've said before, a Christian, a Bible Christian, you need to know how to, you eat the melon and you spit out the seeds. There are some other good Christian authors out there, some of the reformers and some of the Puritans. I just, uh, I listened to this book, Joseph Aline. It's called An Alarm to the Unconverted. And I couldn't believe the power of what he said. I thought, you know, I haven't found that on audio form anywhere. I, I got to get Amazing Facts to record that and release that. It is such a powerful book. I later learned Spurgeon read it every year because it converted and convicted him. And uh, some great things. Other preachers, and sometimes you'll hear, they'll, you know, maybe get something wrong on some issue, but there's a lot of wealth there. Um, hear it, read it, write it. Heard someone say, uh, the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. If you take notes when you hear something biblically, you're going to remember a lot more. You know, if I just preach, right now, if I asked you what I preached about last month, I bet you there's not one in a hundred here who could tell me. And if I, if you said, I knew the subject, and said, all right, tell me some of the sermon, you'd probably be hard pressed, right? You only remember about five or eight percent of what you hear within two weeks the preacher preach. If you write it down, it jumps up to like 20 percent. You'll remember a lot more because it stores it in a different part of your brain. So if you have a good spiritual thought, write it down. I I've also found it's not only write it and hear it, but um, say it. Share what you've learned with someone else. People say, Pastor Doug, how do you remember so much scripture? First of all, I don't know very much. Um, Jay and Andrew is one of the founders of our church. Someone asked him one time, do you have the whole Bible memorized? He said, no. He said, but if the New Testament was destroyed, I could reproduce it. Can you imagine that? Memorize the whole New Testament. Say, they say, Doug, how do you remember so much scripture? It's because I involved in evangelism, I'm sharing it with others, and it's stored just at a different place in my brain, and I remember it because I've said it. So you're not only writing it, you're not only reading it, but then you're saying it. Now, these, are, these are good things, and no one's pulling out a pencil right now, huh? writing that down. <laughs> see it. You can see the word. You see it lived out in people's lives. Say it, and then finally he says, keep it. If you want the word to come alive, after you read something, then put it into practice. Proverbs 4 verse 20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to their flesh. All right. So number one, we grow by eating. Number two, we grow by breathing. You must breathe to live. One of the first things that happens with a new birth is the doctor wants to make sure what? Baby's breathing. And I was there when our kids were born and, and uh, you always kind of wait and you're anxious for that first breath. And even if there's a little crying at the beginning, does that make you sad? Yeah, no, they're alive. Right? There may be tears at conversion. When there's a new birth, there's frequently tears. And might be some pain. But you see a new life happening there. But they've got to breathe. You know, I've, um, uh, more than once I've had a phone call of a young family that had a baby, and they say the baby died. And uh, it's just, it's heartbreaking. You know, you stand there at a little bitty white coffin. Young couple that's completely shattered. And they had said high hopes. They got the room all decorated, the name picked out, they even knew the sex, they got the clothes purchased, they had a party, and um, baby went to sleep, and they call it SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. 
crib death, the old name. So the breathing became more shallow, stopped breathing, and it died. That happens to baby Christians. If you don't learn to breathe, prayer, and how often do you need to breathe? Now you can eat, you know, once or twice a day, you'll be okay, but you can't breathe once or twice a day. The Bible says pray without ceasing. It's like breathing. It's absolutely essential. Jesus told us ask, and that word ask, he said ask, it'll be given you. That word ask in Greek, it's a continuation of asking. Live a life of asking. Look at Paul in Ephesians 6.18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Notice, all, 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 always. Praying always. An attitude of walking with God. This will help you grow. You know, they say that if uh, kids are living in places where they just don't have good ear, it can actually stunt their growth. And you, fresh air. Some of the tallest people in the world live in the mountains where they got clean air, both in Scandinavia and in Africa. Good air. Grow. Pygmies live in the valley of the Congo. So you want to be where you've got good air. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. We're praying about everything. We're praying always in supplication with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving should be part of all prayer. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, and you will grow. Uh, without prayer in the spiritual life, uh, almost quicker than anything else, you begin to dry up and die. So we need to breathe. You need to eat. You need to breathe. You need to exercise. You grow through exercise. If a baby is eating and if a baby is exercising and they're breathing, they don't worry about growing. It's going to happen. It'll be natural. You need to exercise your faith. Now how do you do that? What does that mean? Ephesians 4.15 but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into Him. One of the ways that you exercise as a Christian is you share your faith. You realize you can't keep your faith if you don't give it away. Christianity is a miracle of life that you get to keep by sharing it. You keep it by giving it away. It doesn't mean everybody is a preacher, teacher, pastor, evangelist, but every believer is called upon to do something to share not just by their example. People say, well, you know, if you can't preach, just live it. I think you should live it, but I think you should look for opportunities to share it. You share a track. But as you get engaged in exercising your faith, you're going to get grounded in your faith. Uh, nothing will help you grow closer to the Lord than telling someone else about Him. Your faith is going to be strengthened as you share it with someone else, because you see it's alive. It, 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 it's reawakened in your own heart as you rehearse it. Have you ever seen somebody, uh, you've been talking to them, they had a tragic experience 30 years ago. I, I've, I've seen World War II veterans, and they haven't thought about it in years, and someone will ask them, can you please tell me what happened at Pearl Harbor or D-Day? And they start to tell the story and they break down and begin to cry because they relive the experience. When you tell others what Jesus has done for you, you relive the experience. And it reaffirms it in your own life and you will grow in your maturity. You need to share them. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. If there's a fight involved, exercise. Second Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.3 We are bound to give thanks to God always for you brethren and it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly. Paul was thanking God because they were growing in their faith and the love of every one of you abounds towards each other. Those Thessalonians believers were sharing their faith and they were growing as they shared it in their community. And Revelation 12, 11, they overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. See, we're overcoming by testifying. 
if you will believe in your heart and share with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to proclaim it. We're to share it with others. It does something to seal it in our own lives. You know, if you want to be a Christian, you got to get right in the middle of it. Uh, so often people, they stay near the edge. It's like they're born again and then they stop. They say, oh, praise the Lord, I've got eternal life now. But they don't grow and they become stunted. Years ago this um, ship was sailing across the the uh, Caribbean and um, the water was a little rough, the boat was rocking and pretty soon one of the sailors called man overboard. Well back then that was pretty serious because these big old ships it was hard to turn them around and as it was moving along you know if there were sharks, if the water was too cold and so they hear the cry man overboard. You know someone runs to the back of the boat and they can see this sailors off there bobbing in the water and the captain tells them turn the ship around and they turn the ship around, it lumbers around, they lower the sails, they let down the lifeboat, they send off a rescue party and they found this wet sailor off there. It was warm water, he was okay. They hauled him in, they brought him ashore, everybody cheered because you know I used to read these stories, they, a man went overboard and there was like 50% chance they'd never get him back if it was a cold ocean. And so they had, as soon as they said man overboard, someone was ready on the stern to throw a rope to him right away with a ring on it. Well they get this guy back up in the boat, and he's standing there leaning against the deck and everybody's rejoicing, they're slapping him on the back and that he, they saved him and they hoist up the sails and they begin on their journey again and then pretty soon they hear man overboard. Same sailor fell off. So they turn the boat around again and they lower the sails and they come up to him and they launch the life. A lot of work involved in all this and they paddle up to him and he's still out there alive. They picked him up and they brought him back and the captain says, brother, what seems to be the problem? He says, well sir, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. Some people keep falling out because they stayed too close to where they got in. Once you accept Christ, don't stay in the crib. Don't stay just milk, 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 milk. I get tired of that after a while. I don't know about you. But we need to continue to grow in the Lord. Look for a deeper experience. Look for more work, bigger challenges in, in Christ. A better view of Him that we might grow in our knowledge. You know, they say the fastest growing plant in the world, the fastest growing thing is the bamboo. It, uh, it can grow up to 35 inches in a day. Now how tall would you be today if that's how fast you grew? 35 inches in a day, that is pretty amazing. They actually measure bamboo growth in miles per hour. It's 0 0.00002 miles per hour on a good day. According to RHS Dictionary of Gardening, there are approximately 1,000 species of bamboo. The tallest recorded in the tropics is 130 feet. And the amazing thing is, bamboo is grass. It's in the grass family. But you know why it grows so fast? It's in the ideal environment. Bamboo doesn't grow that fast in the Arctic. It grows near the equator, where it's got a lot of sun, on islands where they get a lot of rain, They've got volcanic soil and the very best of conditions and it grows like crazy. Matter of fact, they can build everything out of bamboo when you go in those parts of the world. If you follow the rules, if you take up the keys for Christian growth, you're going to grow. That's why I hope you won't miss part two when we're going to come back and give you the other four steps or keys in Christian growth.